Our worship begins with the opening acclamation. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Continuing with saying in unison to Gloria. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, the heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal, that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the lessons. A reading from Genesis. Laban said to Jacob, Because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me, what shall your wages be? Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the elder was Leah, and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were lovely, and Rachel was graceful and beautiful. Jacob loved Rachel. So he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. Laban said, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to any other man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife that I may go into her, for my time is completed. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. Laban gave his maid Zilpah to his daughter Leah to be her maid. When morning came, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, What is this that you have done to me? Did I not serve with you for Rachel? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, This is not done in our country, giving the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one and we will give you the other also in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week. Then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as a wife. The word of the Lord. Our psalm for this morning is a portion of Psalm 105, and let us say it in unison. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him, and speak of all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength. 
continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, O children of Jacob, his chosen. He is the Lord our God. His judgments prevail in all the world. He has always been mindful of his covenant, the promise he made for a thousand generations, the covenant he made with Abraham, the oath that he swore to Isaac, which he established as a statute for Jacob, an everlasting covenant for Israel, saying, To you will I give the land of Canaan to be your allotted inheritance. Hallelujah. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows that in the Spirit, that the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed it with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls on finding one pearl of great value. He went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. 
Angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So it's a little unusual for the priest to read the first lesson and the second lesson and lead the psalm, um, but I have what's called priestly privilege, and sometimes I really want to read one of those, and as it happened this week, I was able, because see, when you're ordained, you know, you, you, share, the, you share the love, you share the work, but sometimes I miss being able to read that letter from Paul, that passage from Romans. It's my favorite passage in all of the New Testament. You're sitting there going, he says that every time. But I truly mean it. This one, this one, this one probably would be there. If, if I'm at the gate and Peter comes up and says, all right, watch your best, watch your favorite scripture. You can't lie to St. Peter at the pearly gate. So I'd probably say it's Romans 8. It's Romans 8. Because last Sunday we ended by returning to the second reading, which was from 2 Corinthians, where Paul writes that hope that is seen is not hope. Hope that is seen is not hope. So we want to think a little bit about hope today. Think a little bit about hope. I did say a few Sundays ago, probably six months ago now, that I was preaching on, on the gospel text, and I said, this is probably the gospel text I've preached on the most. You remember what that was? If you do, boy, that's a straight ticket. The passage was, in my father's house are many mansions. The text that I've preached the most on since being ordained priest outside that gospel passage is the one we just heard from Romans for exactly the same reason. They're the two most popular readings at funerals. The moment when we need to be reminded of the hope that we have in God. That all shall be well, that we shall be raised on the last day. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. You know that old hymn? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. You see, what Paul's getting at in that passage today is there's a lot in this world that demands our hope, but does a really good job of destroying our hope. To show you how crazy the year 2020 is, I'm going to quote from Pelagius this morning. Now, if you haven't heard of Pelagius, let me tell you quickly who Pelagius was. Pelagius was uh, an, an English theologian, the 5th century, who was condemned as a heretic, not very popular with the church. Well, that's because Rome didn't like him, but Rome hasn't liked the English church for a long time, particularly if it was a Celtic line of the English church. But Pelagius said that the saddest death that we know, the saddest death is the death of hope. And there's plenty of sad examples right now of hope letting us down. Because all too often, what the world tells us will give us hope, lets us down. 
Paul knew something about the world letting him down. For the main reason that he dared to profess a life that the world did not understand. He dared to profess a life of unimaginable love, unmerited grace, and equality and justice flowing from the throne of God. And the heights and the powers and the principalities and the kings and the emperors of Paul's time wanted no part of that. You know, if you look back in that passage from Romans, when Paul is writing about what will separate us from the love of Christ, he writes, will hardship or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword. I think there's actually seven. I need to get that other finger. Hardship, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. When Paul's writing that, he had endured six of those, and the seventh, the sword, was just a few years away. Paul knew what it meant to live in a world that promised him glory, but did everything it could to tear him down. So where is his hope? For he can see all the world. And he realized that his hope was on nothing less than Jesus. That good old revival hymn continues, When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Paul knew that the principalities and the ways of this world and the powers do one thing, eventually give way. So we have to hold to something that doesn't. And Paul says, that is Jesus. The one who healed the sick, the one who gave sight to the blind, the one that gave himself for us. And we live into that hope. And that hope doesn't die. Even at the gate of death, that hope sings loudly. You are standing on the rock of Christ. And I have raised you up, and I will raise you up. When we look at the rest of the quote-unquote rocks of this world, what do we see but crumbling edifices? But when we look to Christ, when we look to the cross, what do we see but the unimaginable glory of God? that we will behold, and all the countless from ages past behold, for no other reason than you are a beloved child of God. In this passage from Romans, Paul shifts from hope to conviction. That's a good church word. That one will preach. Are you convicted? Now, everybody here is saying, I'm not a convict. I don't want to do that. But yes, we are. We have been convicted. We have been convinced that the greatest gift we have, the greatest hope we have, the greatest source of life we have is Jesus Christ and the way of love that he showed us. I'm not saying that there aren't other things in the world that give us hope, that give us direction, that give us purpose. There certainly are. But Paul asks us, what is your anchor? What is your source? What is your sound footing? That good old revival hymn, the refrain goes, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other sinking sand. And there's only one thing that sinking sand does. It devours us. And guess what, friends? Sometimes in life, we're going to step into a big bunch of sinking sand. For many of us, the last few weeks, the last months, the last part of this year, the, since the beginning, it's felt like sinking sand. When you 
listen, whether you want to or not, a hundred days away from the election, there's a lot of sinking sand. I don't care which side of the aisle or which color you want to follow. There's sinking sand. And it can feel like sometimes the last thing we see is the top of the sand. But you know what Paul was convicted about? It's exactly at those moments when through the sinking sand we feel a hand touch our shoulder. For me, sometimes it's been grabbed me by the hair of the head. However it works, the result's the same. God picks us up out of that sinking sand and says, stand on your rock. We all come with a myriad of of different struggles and frustrations and fears and anxieties that are our sinking sands. But just wait for that touch of Christ that says, my beloved child, I will never let you sink that far. I will raise you up each and every day. Now that's hope. That's something that can convict us. That's something that can give us life. The sinking sand's there, but so is the rock of Christ. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Thanks be to God, who is our rock. Amen. Hmm? It was jumping. Mm. Let us continue by professing our faith as we say the words of the Nicene Creed, which we've been saying since before Pelagius, so we take care of all the heresies. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life for the world to come. Amen. Our prayers of the people are according to Form 4. Let us pray for the church and for the world. In the silence that follows each petition, I invite you to add your own petitions, either silently or aloud. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others 
and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, we commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. We remember especially Jack O'Malley. Lord, in your mercy, Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please greet everyone in the name of Christ. We'll continue with Eucharistic Prayer A. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to your Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. 
This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Continuing with our prayer after communion, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.